It is good to be with you again to study together tonight. I hope you're all doing well, having a good week. I am here in my study on the southwest side of Madison. I'm recording this on Wednesday morning about 1030. And I have a beagle sitting at my feet this morning. And she's doing the best that she can to rest and uh, just laying there being a dog. And I just want to let you know that in case we have a UPS truck drive by or FedEx or the U.S. Postal Service, it is on. And she is out of here barking. And I'll just give you a heads up now in case that happens later in our study. Uh, We have some good changes coming up this coming Sunday morning. We plan on meeting for worship at 9 and also at 11. And we plan on having a Bible class in between those two services at 10 a.m. And so this Lord's Day morning, we'll be meeting on the hour, we might say, at 9, 10, and 11. So we choose between worshiping either at 9 or 11. Hopefully all of us will also be able to be together for class at 10 in between those two services. And that way we get to see the people from the other service and we get to fellowship and mingle a little bit. I am looking forward to that. It's probably good. I can't remember who it was, but a week or so ago, somebody asked me, is the Bible class mandatory? Is the Bible class mandatory? And I should have said yes, because if you fail the class, you will need to take church again next year. You know, some of us have really missed coming together to study and discuss the scriptures, and I am looking forward to it, to be together face to face and ask some questions and get answers from those in the class. Uh, I am really looking forward to that. We hope to pick up where we left off in Hebrews. You may remember we were studying Hebrews when the pandemic began. Many of you still have your books from that Sunday morning class that we left off at last March. Uh, The books are not really necessary for our continuation here. If you have yours, bring that on Sunday. That'd be great. If not, that's all right. Uh, And then also Josh Yancey taught a few of those classes when I was out of town on Wednesday evenings throughout the past year or so. So we'll be picking up where we left off. And I'll try to email that to you as soon as I figure out from uh, John and Aaron where we'll be picking up this coming Sunday. I'll try to get that to you maybe with a bulletin email when it goes out on Saturday so you can read ahead and be prepared for that class. Um, But anyway, we're coming together this coming Sunday for worship and then for class, or for class and then for worship. And as usual, if you're a member of the congregation, we hope you can sign up online at one of those two services. We are not doing Sign Up Genius for the class itself. Uh, Somebody texted this week and asked about that. That's a really good question, but we're only doing the Sign Up Genius for the two services. That helps us to make sure we're spread out as much as we can. And, um, and then we can come together for class in between. And guests are always welcome at either of those services. If you can let us know which one you're coming to, that's great. If not, we understand. And we just want to see you on Sunday, if at all possible, because I know we probably have several with us for the first time tonight. Uh, after the late service, uh, we then hope to grill out together as a congregation. At noon, we plan on having an actual cookout. It has been too long since we've been able to do that. Uh, Gary had some trouble finding a pavilion to rent for our Memorial Day get-together this year, and he finally decided, as a church, we've got a backyard. Uh, Let's use it. And we haven't done that often enough as of right now. On Wednesday, the weather this coming Sunday looks absolutely perfect. Warm and clear, uh, perfect cookout weather. We still need some of you to come to the 9 a.m. service. So because we're cooking out after the 11 a.m., just let's not all come to the 11 a.m. And so if you can come to 9 a.m., that'd be great. If you can do that, awesome. And then class. And then those of you who come to the 9 a.m. service, you have the perfect opportunity to leave after Bible class and run to Quick Trip or Woodman's to get your sides and drinks and uh, maybe help set up while the rest of us are worshiping at 11. But if you need any help signing up, please get in touch either with me or with Kenna, and we hope to see you on Sunday. I am really, really looking forward to doing that. Tonight, we continue with our study of the book of Acts. Acts, of course, explains the growth of the early church. It's written by Luke, who is described later by Paul as the beloved physician. And so he's a medical doctor, and he writes this book to a man by the name of Theophilus. He's described as most excellent Theophilus, and that's a term that was used later in Acts to refer to a couple government officials. And so there's a chance that he is perhaps some kind of government official. And so Luke is writing to him, maybe to convince him of the truthfulness of the Christian faith, to try to uh, give him some sense of calm that the church isn't out to overthrow the government, that kind of thing. But uh, Luke writes the book of Luke and the book of Acts to the same man, this man by the name of Theophilus. Uh, Luke covers the life of Jesus, 
And the book of Acts we might describe as volume two and describing the growth of the early church. It describes a period of time from roughly 30 to 60 AD. Up to this point in the book, we have looked at the first eight chapters. We're partway through chapter nine as of right now. Uh, in the ABCs of Acts, this is our memory tool to try to help us remember what's in each chapter. It's not perfect, but it does help us remember. It's a good tool to use. Uh, we summarize chapter one with the word ascension, where Jesus ascended back into heaven. In Acts 2, we looked at the beginning of the church. In Acts 3, we saw a man carried by his friends, laid down there, left at the temple gates. He's healed by Peter and John. And so the summary is carried and cured. In Acts 4, Peter and John are arrested. They are threatened by the council to stop preaching about Jesus, but they are determined disciples. And so they continue preaching despite those threats. In Acts 5, we had the empty jail as Peter and the other apostles are arrested. And then they're let out of jail by the angel and they go back to preaching. So there is the empty jail. We've summarized Acts 6 with the words first deacons, but always with a question mark. Seven men were appointed to coordinate the feeding of the Greek-speaking widows. It seems to be the work that deacons would do. They are servants, and yet that title is never officially given to them. They seem to be kind of the prototypes for deacons, perhaps. So first deacons with a question mark. In Acts 7, we had Stephen, one of those seven men, stoned to death for preaching. And it's a great sermon summarizing the history of the Jewish people. And so Stephen is a great hero. And then in Acts 8, we had Philip preaching and baptizing the Samaritans and the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, when he first meets the eunuch, Philip asks him, do you understand what you are reading? And you may remember the eunuch replies, how can I? unless someone guides me. So sometimes we need help understanding something. And that, again, is the value of coming together as a church to study these things. And last week, we looked at the first half of Acts 9, the conversion of Saul, later known as Paul. In the ABCs of Acts, we summarize Acts 9 with the phrase, I am Jesus. So Jesus confronts Saul for persecuting the church. Saul wants to know who the Lord is. Who are you, Lord? And the Lord replies, I am Jesus. That's our summary for this chapter. Saul continues on to Damascus, where he prays and he fasts for three days. And Ananias tells him what to do. Now, why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. That comes from a parallel account over in Acts 22. We'll get to that in a few months. And so Saul then, at this point, obeys the gospel. And this brings us to where we are tonight. So we're going to start tonight then with Acts 9 19b through 22. That's our first paragraph tonight. We're not skipping anything, but just notice that the paragraph break fell in the middle of verse 19. And so we're picking up tonight in the second half of verse 19. We covered the first part of that verse with last week's class. So if you have a Bible, great. Uh, it's good to open our own, bring it up on a iPad or a phone, your computer, a hard copy if you can, but I'll also try to have it on the screen for those of you who are uh, joining us online. If you're on the phone, obviously you can't see this, but I uh, hope you have a Bible of your own. But Acts 9, 19b through 22. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. All those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, Is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this name? and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests. But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. I don't know whether we've ever really thought about this, but Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. If we let that sink in a little bit, it's kind of hard for us to imagine what that would have been like. So he came to Damascus specifically for the reason, for the purpose of arresting these people and binding them and bringing them back to Jerusalem to face the chief priests, to be called up on charges of being Christians. But here he sees the Lord on the road, he fasts and prays for three days, he hears the gospel, he obeys it, and now he's fellowshipping with these people he originally came to arrest. And I'm imagining that there might have been some awkward moments in that congregation and some awkward introductions as he met these people and learned their names and perhaps recognized them as those he came specifically to arrest. I know it would have been very easy for Saul maybe to just lay low for a while and just stay away from people and just obey the gospel and go hole up in a cave by himself somewhere. 
But notice in this passage, he does not do that. But he jumps in and he spends some time with the church, as awkward as that might have been. In verse 20, Saul immediately goes to the synagogues. And I would just note here that there are multiple synagogues. There's not just one synagogue in Damascus. There are a plurality of synagogues. Damascus is a rather a large city with a significant Jewish population. As I remember it, the custom was to establish a synagogue once they had 10 Jewish families together. And so Saul then goes to these multiple synagogues in Damascus and immediately, notice he starts to preach Jesus, saying he is the Son of God. That is a bold statement, isn't it? That is a bold claim. But Saul has actually seen the Lord on the road. He's actually obeyed the Lord in the house on Straight Street by obeying the gospel, by being immersed in water for the forgiveness of his sins. And now he has to tell some people about it. This is not something he can keep quiet about. Uh, later, we'll come to know this Saul as Paul, obviously, the apostle and the great missionary. But this seems to be his first mission, doesn't it? This is his first preaching of the gospel himself. And I would point out this seems to be before he's had any kind of uh, special training. This is before he's had any kind of special revelation beyond uh, what he heard from Ananias, what he saw on the road. So what he says here is what he knows from a very limited experience. If you remember from Saul's conversion in the first part of this chapter, God had explained to Ananias that Saul would preach to the Gentiles, to kings, and also to the sons of Israel. And that's exactly what he's doing here. He is preaching to the sons of Israel in the synagogues. This is where he starts. Those who hear this preaching are amazed because they realize who this actually is. This is the man who has been trying to destroy the Christian faith. He came here to persecute the Lord's people. And here he is. Now he is preaching the gospel. He's proclaiming Jesus to be the Son of God. This huge change has taken place. Saul has done a U-turn, hasn't he? Saul has repented. Repentance is a change of mind. It's a change of heart resulting in a change in what we do. And that's exactly what's going on here with Saul. In verse 22, Saul is obviously growing in his faith. He's getting stronger day by day. Uh, remember, Saul already knows the law, doesn't he? He already knows the law of Moses. He knows the prophets. He knows the Psalms. Probably a lot of that he knows by heart, by memory. He already has the information he needs. But now he sees everything from a new perspective, and he's able to apply those scriptures that he's known so well before. And he uses this new perspective to confound the Jews by proving that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. To confound, the word means to pour together, or to confuse, to throw into confusion. In these local synagogues, they now have a highly respected rabbi from Jerusalem in the form of Saul, and he's actively convincing people that Jesus is the Christ. Christ, by the way, goes back to a Greek word meaning anointed. It's the Greek form of the Hebrew word Messiah, which also means anointed, a reference to Jesus being uh, chosen or anointed. By the way, the word Jesus is not in the text in this verse, although the name is implied. I just want to point that out. In the New American Standard, the word Jesus is in italics in most of our Bibles, meaning that the word Jesus is not there. But they put it there to help the sentence make sense in English. If you're reading from the King James Version or the Old American Standard Version, I think they say something about Saul proving that this is the Christ or something along those lines. Maybe a little bit different, but uh, this is the Christ. Not Jesus is the Christ, but this is the Christ. Well, the verse is obviously talking about Jesus, but I just wanted us to be aware of how various translations handle this. The word Jesus is not in the Greek text, but it is implied by the structure of the sentence. So some translations will add that, but uh, hopefully yours will add that with italics so that we know that this was added by the translators. Just wanted us to be aware of this. Well, we continue with Acts 9 verses 23 through 25. Acts 9, 23 through 25. When many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were also watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a large basket. 
So some time goes by. The Jews make a plan to get rid of Saul. He is uh, preaching false doctrine, according to them, probably. That's, uh, that's obviously against what they believe. So Saul gets wind of this, and it's legit. These people are even watching the gates 24-7 so they can put Saul to death. But his people put him in a basket, and they let him down through a hole in that wall. I want to just note that uh, the reference to his disciples in verse 25, it's a little bit interesting, his disciples, referring to Saul's disciples. In a sense, these people were disciples of Jesus, they were disciples of Christ, but they were also Saul's disciples, and we need to admit that, that's just an interesting way of wording this. Uh, later in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Paul would say, be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. And so in that regard, it is okay then to follow a person spiritually, but only to the extent that that person follows Jesus. And that seems to be what's happening here. Well, his disciples save his life by helping him escape. Uh, as we noted back when Saul was the one doing the persecuting in the opening verses of Acts 8, one valid response to persecution is to run, isn't it? If we're threatened for our faith, we don't always need to stay around and wait to get slaughtered. But if we have a way of escape, it seems that we have God's permission to get out of there, uh, up to and including getting stuffed in a basket and shoved through a hole in a wall and let down on a rope. Before we move on from this part of it, I also want us to think about this from Saul's point of view. What a change in circumstances, isn't it? One moment he's doing the work of the Sanhedrin leading a team, rounding up people with their authority, and the, and the next moment he's blind, being led by the hand. Not too long after that, he's preaching Jesus, and now he's the one being let down in a basket through a hole in the wall. Just thinking about this, they probably had the basket and the rope ready to let people through the wall to escape from what Saul was planning on doing, uh, but now he's the one being let down through that hole in a wall. So Saul now has had some huge changes in his life in a very, very short time. Uh, let's continue with Acts 9, 26 through 31. Acts 9, 26 through 31. When he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him, and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. And he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, but they were attempting to put him to death. But when the brethren learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. Well, back up in verse 26, as Saul makes his way back up to Jerusalem, he tries to get plugged into the congregation. That's the way I would put it. Um, he tries to associate himself with the disciples, and this is good. Again, as was the case up in Damascus, it would have been very easy for Paul just to go off somewhere and do his own thing and just not ruffle any feathers, just kind of hole up in a cave or go to some cabin in the woods or whatever. But I would just point out here that Saul needs the fellowship. He needs the connection. There's a huge value in being connected with a local congregation, and that is absolutely what Saul is trying to do here. However, what's the issue? Obviously, the Christians in Jerusalem are afraid, aren't they? They're skeptical. They don't believe that Saul is now a disciple. They, they know Saul as the man who caused most of the church to run for their lives just a chapter or two earlier. They're probably thinking Saul is uh, coming up with some elaborate plot, you know, faking it to get on the inside so he can really root out the true Christians or whatever, so he can do more damage than he did before. And at this point, there's really not much Saul can do to convince them otherwise. He can use his words, but they don't believe him, so they're not believing uh, what he's saying. But Barnabas speaks up and vouches for Saul at this point. So Barnabas puts his own reputation on the line for someone who is practically a stranger. Only perhaps even worse than a stranger, right? Saul is a bad man who's recently had a change. Barnabas is vouching for the change. He takes hold of, Paul, of Saul. He brings him to the apostles. So it's almost as if he brings him by the hand. This is my friend. I know this person. And so he doesn't just tell, 
but he brings and he tells, show and tell, we might say, with Saul. So Barnabas explains what's happened, the vision of the Lord on the road, the fact that Saul had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus, putting his own life on the line, and so on. So Barnabas is explaining then, this man is one of us now. And that's a concept that we still understand today. When somebody we don't know comes to us and they want to associate with us as a congregation, uh, there is some communication that takes place. In some way, the elders make contact with somebody who can vouch for this person, maybe with the elders of the church they're coming from or the preacher, somebody from that church who knows that situation. And we'll see this elsewhere in Acts and a few other places throughout Paul's letters. But it's interesting to me that Barnabas does this for Saul. Because Barnabas did what he did here, we find that Saul is accepted by the church. He is with them, as the text says. And he spends some time in Jerusalem speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. So what Saul had done in Damascus, he is now continuing in Jerusalem. In verse 29, he's discussing, he is arguing with the Greek-speaking Jews, the Hellenistic Jews. So these would be Jewish people from a Greek background, but they, like the Jews in Damascus, are also trying to put Saul to death. So once again, the tables have been turned. Saul, the persecutor, is now being persecuted. So the one who had been chasing people is now on the run himself. And at this point, the brethren get Saul out of there. They take him to Caesarea. They send him off to Tarsus. Uh, later in Acts 22.3, we find this is where Saul was born. So they uh, send Saul back to what is basically his hometown for a little while, kind of get him out of that, uh, that stressful situation. It was causing some havoc in the church. Uh, we end this paragraph on a positive note. Saul, the primary persecutor of the church, has now been converted and the church is at peace for a little while. And this is a rather large area. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, they're being built up. I know sometimes we refer to being edified, like the edifice of a building. And so they are being built up. That's the same thing. They're getting stronger. The church is growing. They're progressing in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And the church is growing in number. They are increasing. Well, now that Saul is out of the picture for a little bit, we have a few quick updates from Peter. And if you remember when we looked at the title of this book, the book of Acts, uh, some have described it as the Acts of the Apostles, but kind of a more accurate title that we gave it in this class was some of the Acts of some of the Apostles. So we've really only focused on Peter and John for a few chapters, and then we moved over to Saul. We're going to get back to Paul a little bit later in a few chapters, so really this is just some of the Acts of some of the Apostles. But anyway, we're going to pick up tonight with a little bit more on Peter before we end this chapter in a few moments here. But let's look at Acts 9, verses 32 through 35. Acts 9, 32 through 35. Now as Peter was traveling through all those regions, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas who had been bedridden eight years, for he was paralyzed. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. Immediately he got up, and all who lived at Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. This is a miracle that's often overlooked. Uh, the healing of Aeneas, this man who was paralyzed and bedridden for the past eight years. This is not one of the most famous miracles in the Bible, is it? This is something uh, many people don't even know about. But before we get to the healing itself, notice that Peter is traveling. So the apostles seem to have been based in Jerusalem, at least for those first few years. But Peter, at least, is using this time to travel around the whole area. So this is Peter. What about the other apostles? We don't know. Uh, we assume maybe they traveled in other directions. They took turns. I don't know. But uh, this, is, this is Peter's activity here. Uh, so here, Peter makes his way to Lydda. Uh, this was also known as Lod, L-O-D, um, in the ancient world. If you look that up online, look under Lod or Lydda. Uh, Lydda is roughly 30 miles west-northwest of Jerusalem, about two-thirds of the way over to the Mediterranean Sea. And Peter goes there to check on the saints who were living there. So he's doing home visits, he's traveling around, checking on things, encouraging people. Uh, just like we might call or text or send a message <clears throat> to each other today to see how it's going. Uh, Peter traveled from one place to another. And on this trip, he runs into Aeneas and he heals him right there on the spot. So he sees a need, he takes care of it. He does this in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, this man gets up, everybody in the area sees this, and they also turn to the Lord. So it's a, just a very brief account of a healing. 
but it fulfills the purpose of healing in the Bible. It wasn't just to make people feel better. It wasn't just to relieve suffering. That was certainly part of it. But it proves that Peter is a messenger from God to these people who didn't know Peter in this area in these days before they had the gospel accounts in written form. So Peter does this healing. He's able to preach and teach. And a lot of people in that area believe. Well, let's continue with Acts 9, 36 through 43. Acts 9, 36 through 43. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which translated in Greek is called Dorcas. This woman was abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. And it happened at that time that she fell sick and died. And when they had washed her body, they laid it in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, having heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him, imploring him, Do not delay in coming to us. So Peter arose and went with them. When he arrived, they brought him to the upper room, and all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing all the tunics and garments that Dorcas used to make while she was with them. But Peter sent them all out and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up, and calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. It became known all over Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And Peter stayed many days in Joppa with a tanner named Simon. So we learn about Tabitha in this passage. This passage holds a special place in our hearts uh, for reasons that are obvious to most of you who know our family. When we started looking for a name for our daughter, we were impressed by this character in the Bible. And we faced a decision. Do we name our daughter Tabitha or do we name her Dorcas? Dorcas is the Greek version of this woman's name. Tabitha is the Hebrew or the Aramaic form of this woman's name. And both words refer to a gazelle. A gazelle as in like a deer, a deer or a gazelle. Um, but I think uh, our daughter might be somewhat relieved that we went with Tabitha instead of Dorcas. Uh, what we didn't really realize is that our son's name means lover of the forest. <laughs> Uh, or hunter, you know, somebody who spends time in the woods. And so we have a hunter and a deer or a gazelle in the family. In hindsight, maybe not the best combination, a hunter and a deer in the same family, but it has worked out <laughs> so far so good. Uh, we find in this passage that Tabitha lives in Joppa. If we were to continue this line from Jerusalem to Lydda, where we just met Aeneas, and continue that line all the way over to the Mediterranean Sea, Joppa is right there on the coast. So just over 40 miles, kind of west, uh, west northwest of Jerusalem. And in this passage, we learn that Tabitha is a woman abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. And so if you're looking for a role model for your children, a life goal of this this is it. And uh, to, to have a member of the family who does something like this, who lives up to her name, uh, would, would truly be, be an awesome thing. Uh, if you remember from our study of Luke, Luke has a way of lifting up the oppressed and those who were often overlooked in the ancient world, women, widows, children, the poor, the sick, and so on. And he does this with Tabitha, doesn't he? He praises this woman. So it's not just this random healing of a woman, but it is this woman we can look up to. She is an example. And Luke explains and describes who she is and what she does. She was constantly doing good deeds to actually help people. In verse 37, we find though that Tabitha gets sick and she dies. And they wash her body as the custom was. They lay it in an upper room. But when they hear that Peter's nearby, they send two men to go get Peter, and they tell him, do not delay. It's interesting to me that we're not told that they tell Peter what they want to happen. They don't say, come raise her from the dead. Um, but to me, it does seem that this is a bit more than a funeral. There's not a rush so he can preach a funeral, at least in my mind. That does not really seem what's going on here. We're not told, uh, but there is a sense of urgency here. So perhaps in the back of their minds, they're, they're thinking this might be a possibility. I, I wouldn't swear my soul on that, but it just seems kind of strange that they're in such a hurry to get Peter there. Well, when Peter arrives, the disciples bring him into the upper room. 
and we have the widows weeping and showing Peter all the clothing that Tabitha used to make. The idea of the being that the widows perhaps uh, helped her with this, or maybe Dorcas or Tabitha kind of organized these women, got them going, making these things, and, and that kind of thing. And I think of some funerals that I've done through the years, and some funerals I've been to, where this would have completely been possible to walk into the funeral home or the church building and, and to see things that this person has done. Some people really have a, a reputation for helping others, even to the point where we could probably spread it out like this. This is what this person has done. We have members of the Four Lakes congregation like that. And they, they put these garments out there on display. This is what this woman has done to actually help people. And without anybody even asking him to do it, at least as far as Luke records it, Peter kneels down and he prays. Uh, this, by the way, is one of several postures that people have taken for prayer in the Bible. Sometimes people will ask about this, you know, what's the best way to pray? Sometimes people in the Bible would stand to pray. Sometimes people would lift their hands to God in prayer as if receiving a blessing from God. Uh, sometimes people in the Bible would just lay down flat on their front with their faces in the ground to pray. Uh, but here, Peter kneels. I'm reminded of a story that I've shared here years ago about a telephone repair guy walks into a church office and the preacher is having a discussion with a few other preachers about the best posture for prayer. And one preacher says, I find it best to kneel. And the other guy says, I find it best to stand and close my eyes. And the preacher says, I find it best if I lay down on the ground. And, and the telephone lineman replies, personally in my life, the most fervent prayer that I've ever prayed was, when I fell and ended up hanging upside down from a telephone line off a 30-foot pole or whatever. And I think we understand what he was saying there. It's not the posture that we take, but it's the, the reverence and the urgency of our prayer. So here Peter kneels. Uh, most of you know I preached down in Janesville for seven years before coming to Madison. And the pews down there at their church facility are really far apart. You can just, you don't have to scoot between them. You can just walk down the rows in between those pews. And uh, years ago, one of the uh, old timers told me that they were installed that way back in the early 1960s so that people in that congregation could kneel for prayer. That was apparently the custom at that time in that congregation. And that's what Peter does here. He kneels down to pray and then he says, Tabitha, arise, or Tabitha, get up. Um, so much I could say here uh, about uh, not too many other people in the world have the uh, privilege of, of saying, Tabitha, get up. Um, but I guess I'm in that category here. I, I find, that, uh, find that interesting, but I'm thankful for that great privilege to kind of follow in Peter's footsteps here. Tabitha, get up. And uh, she opens her eyes. She sees Peter. And she immediately sits up. And Peter then takes her by the hand, helps her up, and presents her alive to those who have come together. And once again, word gets out, doesn't it? Just like with Aeneas, word gets out. And many more believe in the Lord in this area because of this. They realize that Peter is speaking on God's behalf. That miracle proves that Peter is inspired. That is uh, the main purpose of miracles in the Bible. In the last verse, we find that Peter sticks around for a while, uh, staying with uh, a tanner named Simon. So he was would be the one who would take the animal skins and treat them in a way that they could be used for tents or clothing or whatever. Remember, um, you know, we know about that from the scriptures. That would make a person ceremonially unclean to touch a dead body. So it's an interesting transition that, that Peter is about to go through here. So this is kind of a, a transition that sets us up for what we hope to study next week. So next week, let's pick up with Acts 10. You may want to read ahead if you can. You may want to be looking for some way to summarize chapter 10 using the letter J. So J will be next week's summary in the ABCs of Acts. Be looking for that. If you have a good one, please text me, email me, uh, give me a call. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, thank you for taking the time to study together tonight. I hope to see you for worship on Sunday, either at 9 or 11. And then please also plan on joining us between those two services for a study from Hebrews at 10 a.m. And then let's plan on eating together at noon and have a good time of fellowship this coming Lord's Day. Again, right now they're saying it should be clear and warm on Sunday. This would be a great time to sign up. Let me know if I can help. Let Gary Mueller know if you have any questions about what to bring, anything that uh, you need to uh, check in with him on, that he'd be a good contact for what's going on at noon on Sunday. And uh, let me know if you have something that we need to be praying about or call one of the other elders, text or email them. Their information is on the front of the bulletin that most of you should have. 
Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the great and awesome God. And tonight we've looked at the change that took place in the life of your servant Saul, and we've been encouraged by his persistence in the preaching of the gospel in spite of persecution. We pray that we would have the courage to follow his example. And we've also looked again tonight at Peter, and we're thankful for these accounts. We're thankful for the healing of Aeneas and for the raising of Tabitha from the dead. And we pray that these two events would strengthen our faith and bring us closer to you. We pray that we would serve others just as Tabitha did. We're looking forward to meeting her face to face someday. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.